Along the Pacific Rim of Fire, in the deepest reaches of the ocean, a treasure trove of valuable minerals has been forming in the perpetual darkness for millions of years. Because of increasing global demand, companies are now developing the high-tech ships and robotic mining equipment needed to harvest these sources of cobalt, copper, gold, manganese, silver, zinc and rare earth metals from the bottom of the ocean. Many of the world's deep sea minerals have been discovered in the Southwest Pacific and harvesting these resources could provide a massive economic boost to many Pacific Island countries. But these countries are also concerned about the possible impacts this new industry could have on the marine environment and fishing resources on which they currently depend. The story of these valuable deep sea minerals is not just a story about the small developing island countries of the South Pacific. It is also a story about anyone who has ever bought a mobile phone or any other product that relies on these metals. Because each day, each new purchase is forcing us to shine an even brighter light into the primordial darkness where some believe that life on Earth first began. There's a strong school of thought that hydrothermal vents, in fact, offer the, the conditions that are, are most similar to, to what would have faced the, the origins of life on, on Earth. And so there is that interest in particular with the, the bacterial side of things, the microbial uh, communities around vents. Seeing what they're adapted to, how they could then sort of start to develop into, into higher life forms. It's clear that the developed world is not going to be interested in decreasing its standard of living and it's clear that the developing world wants to increase its standard of living and uh, the resources that are available right now in land-based mining are not adequate to see those two things happen and we're going to need additional sources of metals and the deep ocean is one way to augment uh, what is now obtained from the continents or from land-based mining. We have to consider the interactions with other animals and with the wider deep sea marine ecosystem. Even if we can't, even if we can't measure or fully understand how things operate, we know enough about what should be linked to other things within that ecosystem that we can, we can sort of um, provide a, a good scientific guess of what might be affected or what might not be by a certain operation. We're mining lower and lower grades on the land and we're mining in more remote areas. So we have to go to places like interior Africa, to Alaska, to interior Papua New Guinea, to uh, remote areas where indigenous populations might be um, impacted uh, by this. And we have to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the earth because all the surface deposits have been mined already over the last hundreds of years. And so we're going deeper and deeper and deeper to get to deposits that are lower and lower and lower in metal content. So the deep ocean offers completely the opposite. You have high metal contents right at the seafloor. And so this is a, a very big concern uh, for environmental reasons. In the Pacific, most commercial interest has focused on deep sea minerals known as seafloor massive sulfides manganese nodules and cobalt rich crusts. But these different resources pose very different challenges for both mining companies and environmental managers. Seafloor massive sulfides can form relatively quickly near hydrothermal vents in just a matter of decades and they can provide very high concentrations of metals at the relatively shallower depths of around 400 to 3500 meters. These deposits have largely formed along the actively spreading centers of the oceans where the seafloor moves apart very slowly. High pressure, superheated water carries dissolved metals from deep within the earth. 
When it escapes through cracks on the ocean floor, it mixes with cold seawater and the rapid drop in temperature forces the minerals to precipitate out into the surrounding seabed where it can form into distinctive chimneys. Sometimes, in the very hot vents, known as black smokers, the fluid turns black because of the emerging sulphides and these seafloor massive sulphide deposits are rich in metals such as copper, gold, silver, zinc and lead. Since they were first discovered in 1977, these hydrothermal vents have also been found to be teeming with life. But unlike most other life forms on Earth that depend directly and indirectly on sunlight for their energy, these vent communities thrive on hydrogen sulphide in hot water as their source of energy. The chimneys, when they form initially, uh, tend to develop so, uh, over a period of time, or fairly quickly in fact, um, a mat of uh, bacterial deposits growing on the outside which, where the temperatures aren't fiendishly hot, they're less, less than perhaps 110 degrees, much, much hotter than, than the surrounding seawater, which typically is between 0 and 5 degrees centigrade. Uh, and uh, these, these thermophilic or high temperature microbes are living there, and they become the, the, uh, the start of, a, of the whole food chain. Marine scientists are still learning about the hundreds of new and unusual organisms that depend on hydrothermal vents for life. Organisms like giant mussels and mouthless tube worms rely on the symbiotic bacteria living inside them to process these chemical rich waters. Mussels, for example, are an important type of animal that's, that's commonly found around South Pacific hydrothermal vents. And apart from being huge, and they really are large, some of them are over a foot long, uh, they can get up to 350, uh, 400 millimetres. They, they're similar in shape to the ones which you'll see in, in rocky shore systems. But what separates them is that they are adapted to feed off the hydrogen sulphide that is emitted from these hydrothermal vent systems. So that they don't rely upon the carbon-based photosynthetic system, which is fundamental for most human life. They actually utilise the sulphides. And that's, that's pretty cool because Hydrogen sulphide is, of course, as we know, toxic to us and, in fact, most forms of life. In the young chimney environments, there's a, a lot of uh, a unique a fauna, uh, odd snails, tube worms, mussels, blind crabs, blind fish, and so on that live there, which are unique pretty well to that, that environment. And uh, that, so whilst these deposits are forming, there's a lot of concern about, about the fauna, the biota, and and if people were to start mining those, then uh, it's got to be done in a responsible way that's, that's not going to wipe them out. Some observers fear that deep sea mining activities could cause lasting and irreparable damage to these unique habitats before we develop any detailed understanding of these new species. While others point to the fact that these dynamic vent systems are already constantly experiencing their own natural cycles of destruction and restoration. When you go to a new vent system, and they are being found pretty much all the time, uh, we're finding new animals, new communities because those, those situations are very site-specific. They have different combinations of depth and hence pressure, the chemical concentration, and the temperature. So some of them are as, are as hot as 300, 400 degrees Celsius. Others are much more diffuse. Each of the vent communities is adapted specifically for the, the suite of environmental conditions that occur at that, at that particular site. Some scientists believe that if the right management systems are put in place, the potential impacts of mining these vent systems can be minimized. Others also point out that these deep sea minerals will be critical for developing the green technologies needed to help break the world's dependence on fossil fuels. Most people don't realize this, but green technology, for example, uh, solar cells, wind turbine engines, uh, electric cars, uh, hybrid cars, 
And a lot of these kinds of things require large quantities of rare metals. Metals that we do find in the deep ocean, metals like the rare earth elements, uh, metals like gallium, indium, tellurium, and some very, very rare things uh, that are not abundant on the continents and that green and high technology applications absolutely require. In 1997, the Canadian company Nautilus Minerals was granted the first offshore exploration license in Papua New Guinea. It plans to use underwater robotic technology to extract up to 1.3 million tons of seafloor massive sulphide ore per year from a dynamic vent site in the Bismarck Sea, 30 kilometers off the west coast of New Island. Nautilus says its proposed seabed mining process will have a small footprint that will only impact on an area equivalent to three football fields. The proposed method will use a portable extraction system that can be moved from one site to another in a matter of days. Underwater robots will cut and crush ore that will then be pumped through a closed pipe to a surface vessel before being shipped away for further processing. In the deep ocean at a mine site, you don't have anything but the mining machine on the seafloor. There's no infrastructure there. There's no roads, there's no buildings, there's no uh, processing plants, none of that occurs. Uh, so that kind of uh, environmental advantage to the deep ocean is really, really significant. The vehicles they're using, or they are likely to be using down on the seafloor, is crunching up, to grinding up some of the, the rock to get at the, at the sulphide. It's then pumping it up to the surface, and then the discharges are coming back down from somewhere between the vessel and, and the seafloor. So there's a lot of potential impact uh, that we, we don't really understand until the operation starts and until we actually see whether the ideas of, of a brand new mining operation and whether the technology that's being talked about and designed is actually going to be effective at, at reducing the, the impacts. But mining companies say the reason they have been looking for extinct black smokers in dynamic vent fields has as much to do with basic engineering practicalities as protecting marine life. One of the reasons why commercial interests are targeting uh, the inactive seafloor massive sulfides simply because uh, you know, there is no danger uh, you know, associated with mining seafloor massive sulfides. We don't have to deal with a high temperature of 300 to 400 uh, degrees Celsius that you have to deal with in an active seafloor massive sulfides. And as well, uh, you, know, you don't have to, to destroy or you know, significantly affect a uh, huge uh, or significant amount of biological uh, biological communities associated with the active ones. For quite a long time it was thought that if you concentrated on the old fields, uh, be able to mine those without any real environmental problems, but uh, they're very hard to find. There's no smoke coming out of them, so-called smoke, uh, so you can't track them down looking for the smoke plume, uh, and techniques to find these old deposits are theoretically possible, but they've, they've not really been well developed yet. And also, there's a likelihood that in the old deposits, uh, the metals that are valuable will have been leached out and gone back into the seawater. While most agree that mining seafloor massive sulfides will have an impact on the immediate marine environment, there is still some uncertainty about the impacts they may have on the wider ecosystem. We're not looking at just one site or one species. You're looking at how everything fits together. And that's the importance of of taking into account the three-dimensional nature of, of the deep sea, where even though the seabed mining operation might affect the sea floor, those impacts potentially come right up through the water column as well, either through, as I've mentioned, direct impacts or indirect impacts, such as sedimentation or the release of, of toxic material into the, into the water column, or even just things that change up through the food chain. Even the snails and the crabs, which are not living in the really high temperature water, uh, are living in water which, which is chemically affected by the, by the whole process. So they're fairly resilient and uh, the, the, the sort of operations that a mining company will carry out will inevitably damage them and squash them. The snails are going to get squashed and so on. Uh, but in given time and provided it's done carefully with, with careful planning and so on, uh, eventually they, they will re-establish themselves. <laughs> In 
In the South Pacific, most commercial fisheries include tuna at depths of 300 to 400 meters and snapper fisheries down as far as 500 meters. All these fishing resources are shallower than proposed mining activities for seafloor massive sulfides at around 1,000 to 3,500 meters and far shallower than the much deeper manganese nodule resources that sit at 4,000 to 6,000 meters. Most experts agree that any impacts of mining localized seafloor massive sulfide deposits will be too deep to have any direct impact on Pacific Island fisheries resources. However, there are concerns about the potential impacts that result from sediment plumes and the process of pumping product up to the surface vessel before returning the waste material and waters back to the seafloor. There's a, a connection which we, we don't well understand between the deep sea and the upper surface layers. We're learning about it a lot. But we also don't know much in many cases about the early life history stages of a lot of the, the commercial fisheries. Uh, so even though the tuna fisheries and snapper fisheries appear to be uh, quite shallow and sustainable, we don't know much about how the early life history stages could be affected. According to international law, any Pacific Island nations that are contemplating deep sea mining must also commit to protect the ocean environment, minimize pollution and preserve any rare or fragile ecosystems. Because of the technical challenges and high costs of monitoring impacts on deep sea environments, it is critical that any research initiatives be carried out in partnership with the mining companies and scientific organizations from developed countries. If any Pacific Island countries decide to proceed with deep sea mining, a comprehensive and fully independent environmental impact assessment or EIA should be carried out to identify possible measures to avoid or minimize environmental impacts. Ongoing environmental monitoring must also be used to guide any future activity by helping to understand the potential impacts and recovery rates for any affected species. The other main deep sea mineral resource exciting commercial interest in the Southwest Pacific are known as manganese nodules. These potato-shaped nodules form over millions of years as minerals leach from the seawater to collect in layers around a core such as tiny stones or shark's teeth. Manganese nodule resources contain manganese, copper, cobalt, nickel, titanium and rare earth elements. They have been found on the seabeds of the Cook Islands Kiribati, Tuvalu and Niue. Manganese nodules are seen as more challenging to harvest because they are generally found partially buried in the sediments that cover vast plains in the deep areas of the ocean, predominantly at depths of 4,000 to 6,000 meters. For, for manganese um, uh, nodules uh, and uh, cobalt rich crust, because they cover extensively a huge area of the seabed, uh, so that will, uh, you know, if they are going to be mined, you know, there will be, you know, reasonable or significant amount of disturbance of the seabed and uh, uh, the biological communities associated with them. Given the large size of proposed mining sites, it's feared that plans to essentially vacuum up the manganese nodules could create huge plumes of sediment that could harm and even suffocate local marine life. Inactive fauna such as sponges and corals that have been growing slowly for thousands of years could be highly vulnerable to any potential disturbance by mining. We're talking about hundreds if not thousands of square kilometres of, of resource potentially being, being mined. The main issue there is going to be the, the sediment plume. The, the nodules are sitting on the top of quite fine sediment and from some of the work done in the eastern Pacific, the sediment plume that's generated by by dredging these, these nodules is very extensive. It hangs around for a long time because the, the bottom currents at those, those depths are often quite low. So you get this, this large uh, enhanced area of particulate matter in the water column, basically a sediment cloud, that can come several hundred metres up into the water column and it can disperse very slowly over 100 kilometres or more. The International Seabed Authority was established under the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea to organize and control all mineral-related activities in the international seabed area outside national jurisdictions. 
Extensive studies of the manganese nodule resources in the clarion clipperton zone of the Central Eastern Pacific have helped the International Seabed Authority to produce environmental guidelines that will be critical for the management of deep sea minerals in the Southwest Pacific. It does mean that we've got a fair idea of where to start, what we need to look at as a science community and what we can do to support the Pacific Island countries in, in uh, carrying out their environmental impact assessments and trying to, to engage managers, trying to, to help managers uh, with ensuring that the, the activities of any, any individual company or any individual mining operation are not likely to, to impact their, their marine environment. Scientists agree that there are some environmental impacts that can only be verified during an actual mining operation. This is one of the reasons the small developing nations of the Pacific are working closely together to ensure any mining activity is guided by the precautionary approach and the effective monitoring of any deep sea mining operations in their shared waters. What we are encouraging Pacific Island countries to move away from is a, what we call a race to the bottom scenario where countries have to work on their own and compete against each other. I think that's you know, a bad scenario for the whole region. We want them to work together um, you know, against a background of limited resources, a limited knowledge that they have, that we can put those resources together and strengthen our, uh, our policy and our legislation and our capacity to be able to fully and meaningfully engage in this new industry. In 2011, at the request of its member countries, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community started the four-year Pacific Deep Sea Minerals Project with funding from the European Union. This project is designed to strengthen the capacity of Pacific ACP states to improve the governance and management of their deep sea mineral resources. The project is working to help Pacific Island countries build effective legal frameworks, increase technical capacity, develop effective environmental management systems and increase greater public engagement on the issues surrounding the governance of deep sea minerals resources. When it comes to deep sea minerals and mining, I think you know all Pacific Island countries they don't have the capacity to deal with a new industry. So that's where the project comes in and, pro and, uh, and the project is only part you know, of the answer. You know, we are trying to engage all the stakeholders and at the same time build capacity in the region, but we need uh, a longer uh, intervention or a longer project to assist Pacific Island countries to make sure that they have the capacity, that they have the resources to, be, to, move, to ensure that they manage their resources you know, in a much better way. Pacific Island countries must cooperate at a regional level to ensure that the emerging deep sea minerals industry is managed in a way that will help to minimize any potential impacts on its critical marine and fisheries resources. If there is an environmental impact assessment being carried out in one of these uh, uh, mineral deposits in the region, you know, we, are, you know, we can organize experts uh, from around the world to review the EIA report. So that's another contribution that we have put on the table uh, for the countries uh, that, that we can offer the country uh, if they have any EIA and they don't have the capacity to review the environmental impact assessment report. Now we'll contact our network throughout the world who are willingly uh, going to carry out the review of the EIA report and provide you know, that's much needed uh, sound advice uh, to our member countries. Most experts agree that it is vital for Pacific Island countries to take a regional approach that will help to minimize any mining impacts on the wider marine ecosystem. Such an approach would include efforts to ensure that mining does not occur in known spawning areas for important marine resources. It would also help to increase understanding on how the discharge of processed waters will impact on marine species. Countries must also ensure that the impacts of any sediment plumes generated by the seafloor mining operations are assessed before mining starts. The way forward to ensure that we don't make, we don't make a real mess of it is to ensure that we're, we're protecting areas that uh, will ensure that the, the deep sea ecosystem can still continue to, to function even if there is some, some mining operation affecting parts of it. There's going to be an impact 
but the impact can be minimalized. There's a lot of things that can be doing with bio done with biological corridors, relieving parts of the seafloor unmined so that the areas can be recolonized, working in areas where uh, the larvae of organisms will be upstream from the bottom currents and bring larvae down to the a mine site once the mining is done to help repopulate the areas. So there's a lot of things that can be done to see that the impact, the environmental impact is minimal. It's not going to be zero. That will never happen. It will never be zero. There will be some impact always. Uh, but it can be minimized and that's the real goal of all of it. That's the real goal and the benefit for all of, all, all of, uh, of the human race. It is clear that more support will be needed to enable Pacific Island nations to develop the effective systems needed to monitor any ongoing impacts once deep sea mining activities begin. But there is now great hope the Pacific region will continue to strengthen its collaborative efforts to minimize any significant impacts on the marine environment on which its communities depend. So I think that my personal view would be that we can achieve that balance through well thought out, well structured, well planned science and in particular a very strong partnership between the industry on the one hand, managers on the other, uh, NGOs, scientists, we've, we've all got a role to play in this and that's the exciting prospect for the Pacific Island situation I think. Everybody is on board, there's a very clear willingness to adopt the precautionary approach, adopt the ecosystem principle and try and do things, do things right. The story of these deep sea minerals is also a story about the people of the South Pacific, their hopes and their daily struggles to survive. As we shine an even brighter light into the darkest depths of the ocean, we must continue to ask ourselves about the benefits and consequences of mining the deep sea. While there is a chance that many of the environmental impacts of deep sea mining may be minimized, we must also continue to ensure that any economic benefits will actually work to bring a much brighter future for the people of the South Pacific.